Welcome to ACT OUT. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. So last week, we touched on the issue of anti-intellectualism in this country, and this week, we're diving in even further. Via creativity and intellectualism, the power of education, and the drive to educate and be educated, even when it's illegal. Yes, there are those who are quite literally banned from higher education in Iran, and their resilience, their creative responses both inside of Iran and outside should serve as inspiration to us here, who continue to battle against the dumbing down of our people and the crippling of our own education system, from K through college, from classroom to newsroom. Salim Viancourt is a journalist, writer, and very much a creative activist. He is the founder of Not A Crime, Street Art for Education Equality. As the site states, thousands of young people are barred from higher education in Iran because of their beliefs. We fight this injustice through creativity and art. Indeed, around the globe, Not A Crime has worked with a slew of street artists to create the visual representation of this simple phrase, education is not a crime. We sat down with Salim to talk more about this project, the backstory of this oppression in Iran, and how creativity fuels change. Take a look. So uh, talk about this barrier to education in Iran, both the political and the theological reasons for it, and the effect on the people. It's a great question. So the Baha'is in Iran, um, the Baha'is are Iran's largest religious minority. Uh, they, they're a group that believes in principles like the equality of men and women and the need for universal education and ideas like that. And they've been persecuted in various ways uh, for a long time since the emergence of the religion in the 19th century. But it was really with the, uh, the rise of the Islamic Republic after the revolution in 1979 that the Baha'is came in for systematic persecution. They were executed, over 200 were executed in the first few years of the revolution. And then after that, after a large international outcry made it very difficult for the, the Iranian government to, to actually execute the Baha'is, they've been uh, persecuted and discriminated against in a number of ways. There have been a lot of, a lot of um, arbitrary arrests. They're vilified in the state-run media, um, a lot of other things. And then also one of the principal forms of the persecution is that Baha'is are barred from going to, to university. They're denied higher education. And uh, the, the reasons for this uh, politically are that the Baha'is are, are have been a scapegoat community for the government for a long time. Um, and uh, when the Iranian government is trying to, to, to point uh, blame at a community for its problems in the world, for example, it says that, oh, it's the, the Baha'is who are in league with the British or the Americans, or they're part of the Zionist conspiracy, these kinds of things. Um, and theologically, the problem is that uh, the Baha'i religion is, uh, is really, it, it believes in the oneness of all religions, but it, uh, it, it also teaches that men and women are equal and that there's no need for a clergy. And these are ideas that uh, are really threatening to the uh, established theocratic um, establishment, uh, the establishment theocracy in Iran, where the clergy are, are in power and a, a, lot, a lot of their, their strength comes from the fact that they are uh, a patriarchal uh, body of people who hold religious authority over their entire society. So when you have a religious community advocating for ideas that cut against that, that, uh, that really seek to change the established order of things, it, uh, it threatens that, uh, that status quo very strongly. So the, uh, the, the denial of higher education to the Baha'is is part of a larger pattern of trying to suppress and, and, and actually strangle the Baha'i community over a long period of time. There's this long-term policy that the Iranian government has to, to, to reduce the viability of the Baha'i community as a group of people. Um, and, uh, and this is demonstrated uh, by a policy document from 1991 that was uh, created by the, the, the Cultural Council of the Islamic Republic and signed by the uh, then and still current Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, who, uh, who, who authorized this document. And this document calls for the progress and development of the Baha'i community to be blocked through a, a large number of different uh, uh, policies, barring them from certain public, from, from a lot, uh, barring them from a lot of uh, different jobs, um, generally harassing them, um, obviously completely denying them any access to employment in the public sector, and crucially, uh, barring their, their access to higher education, because education, as everybody knows, is the lifeblood of any society. And if a group is barred from, from learning, if its, uh, if its opportunities to learn and advance are, are blocked, then that community will suffer and will gradually dwindle over time. So the effect on the Baha'i community has been uh, uh, damaging in a certain sense, except that the Baha'is didn't take this lying down in Iran nor did they respond to it with, uh, with violence or, or with anger or, or with uh, direct opposition. 
Instead, what the Baha'is did in 1987, they created something called the Baha'i Institute for Higher Education, which is an informal underground university designed to give young Baha'is in Iran a chance to study where it wouldn't have been, wasn't available otherwise. So all of the dismissed Baha'i academics banded together and started holding classes in their own homes. Baha'is would go, young Baha'is would go and, and learn uh, core subjects like, uh, like psychology and mathematics and engineering and so on. Um, as far as is possible in these uh, in these homes, and it evolved into including distance learning with West, Western universities, and it's evolved further to uh, to include a large number of online classes with instructors around the world, including many who are not Baha'is who volunteer their time, um, and it's been so successful that thousands of people have gone through this system. Um, many of those people have gone to the West for higher education. Many of the people who've been able to do that have gone back to Iran to continue teaching the next generation. But it's not to say that it's uh, it's without cost or that it's easy, because if you're a young Baha'i, you've got to somehow have a job, you've got to keep up with your classes in the BIHE, which are as demanding as a uh, as a mainstream university. Baha'is have to sit the national entrance exam in order to get into their their own uh, underground, their own informal program. They have to keep on top of coursework. Um, so it's, it's difficult to live the life that they have to live in order to just be able to sort of survive and do these classes in a society where you don't even ac have access easily to things like university libraries or laboratories or workshops or, or whatever it might be that you need. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of the the the, uh, the work in Saudi Arabia that people have been doing online, just this sort of dissenting online because they can't do it in public. What has the crackdown been on this? I mean, or has there been a crackdown on the underground university? There have been uh, periodic crackdowns in the 80s and in the 90s, especially, and I think in the early 2000s, um, there have been raids on large numbers of Baha'i homes where either teachers or administrators of the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education were living, confiscation of materials like computers and coursework and books and so on. And right now there are something up to 10 teachers or administrators who are in jail, which is a lower number than it has been previously. A few people have been recently released after serving their, their jail terms. But people who are teachers have been in jail for no reason but for teaching young Baha'is. Uh, materials have been taken away. Um, there is a there is periodic disruption of the BIHE by the government, by the, uh, the Revolutionary Guard by different parts of the, uh, the Iranian uh, establishment in order to try and to stop this, uh, this program from, from continuing. Shifting a little bit into, into what your work is, fighting injustice through creativity and art, talk about this particular approach. Well, uh, the campaign began in 2014 when the Iranian-Canadian journalist Maziar Bahari, who, who has his own story of, uh, of being um, persecuted by the Iranian government, spent 118 days in jail simply for reporting um, on the, uh, the protests that followed the 2009 election crisis. When he was eventually released and, and left Iran, he wanted to start doing all the stories that he knew he could do inside the country, which uh, included especially the story of the persecution of the Baha'is. And he was really, Mazir is not a Baha'i, he was really touched by the, uh, the positivity of the Baha'i attempt to deal with being denied education, not by protesting and not simply by lying down, but by creating their own informal educational program. So to, to tell that story, he created a documentary film to light a candle, which is uh, available online. And that film was then screened ar around the world. And I started working with Mazir at that time. And off the back of that film, we felt that we had to continue with the campaign and to use uh, the, the seeds of, of, of the story itself, creativity and positivity, to, to tell the story to a wider audience. And, and the goal of the Not A Crime campaign is really to, to, to gradually help this, this issue, situation, this issue, become one of the world's stories of our time. And so we thought that if we wanted to do something that was eye-catching, that engaged with communities and was positive, it felt like art and especially street art was a, a very meaningful way to do that. So then to talk about, because I understand that you're in London, uh, and obviously this is a campaign that, that circle, as you said, it has to do with, with diversity and equality worldwide, but it is it does circle back to this issue in Iran. Why is Harlem a, a center point for this? Well, uh, so I'm in London now, but I actually spent most of uh, uh, this year living in Harlem um, to, to, to help work on the campaign. Um, we, we came to Harlem Gradually, uh, when we started the street art campaign uh, in early 2015, I think we, we wanted to do it all around the world, and, and we have done it all around the world. There have been murals in, in London, in Australia, and Brazil, and South Africa, um, uh, India, um, and a few other places. And on the one hand, it is a campaign that doesn't need to be in any one place. But when we came to do it in New York, uh, not this past summer, but the summer of 2015, we, we, we had chosen New York to be the hub of the campaign principally because 
the United Nations General Assembly meets there every year. And, uh, and the president of Iran, who is uh, President Hassan Rouhani right now, um, along with all these other world leaders, shows up when the, when the uh, General Assembly opens and they all give speeches. And it's, it's a great media opportunity for us to, to make a point um, when people will be paying more attention to issues to do with human rights, to do with Iran, to do with world issues generally. So that was why we chose Harlem. That's why we chose the summer. That's why we've been building up to these two Septembers in a row. But then in 2015, when we were painting our murals, we found that we were received most warmly and uh, and uh, most most obviously um, in Harlem, because it dawned on us that people in that part of New York understood intuitively what it is to to deal with discrimination, what it is to try and overcome it. And on top of that, Harlem is also a cultural hub with the Harlem Renaissance and with uh, everything that's followed in a in a place where so many civil rights actions happened as well in the 1960s. This is a place that gets not only civil rights um, and the need to overcome discrimination, but creative responses to that. So when we told people that we're trying to paint murals about uh, this issue uh, elsewhere um, and in Iran, they just, they got it in a way that they didn't necessarily get it anywhere else. And they welcomed it as well. And we really wanted to start to create connections between different communities of struggle, different peoples who know uh, of discrimination and who've been trying different positive ways to overcome it. So it's not so much about, uh, it has to be in Harlem. It's about talking, it's about Harlem representing uh, the the quest to overcome discrimination in the United States, and that this is a parallel story in Iran, and that these two stories can support each other, can help uh, boost each other in in you know in people in the public profile and the public general awareness. And I think that's why we wanted to create this partnership. And it's been very. Uh, I think we feel that there's so much still to do, but it's been a success so far in that the community has embraced us. There are now 19 murals in Harlem. Many of them are on schools. We've been able to work with so many fascinating activists and community leaders um, in, in the neighborhood as well as teachers and to make connections with students. So for, for us, it's been um, a, a real privilege to, to be able to work with the people of Harlem. And for me personally, it was one of the best experiences of my professional and personal life to be able to do something so, uh, so, so substantive and meaningful and to do it in a place uh, like that. So I do want to ask... Um... Does this tie into, because you said that the, in, in, in Iran, that instead of protesting or instead of just accepting this decision, they have created this underground uh, education system. Outside of Iran, is there or are there uh, groups of people that are taking to the streets or, you know, protesting outside the UN? Is there sort of, a, to go along with this creative response, is there a street response to this as well? good question. Uh, so the Baha'i community, so as I said, Mazir is not a Baha'i, I am a Baha'i. Um, the Baha'i community as a community is not given to protest um, in, a, in a way. It's not uh, It's not the way the Baha'i community tries to affect positive change in the world. That's not to criticize protest at all. I think many people feel that it's a, an important part of their self-expression and their political action, and that's, 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 that's great. But uh, Baha'is really uh, focus their efforts on community building um, and on and other kinds of actions. So as far as the campaign is concerned, there haven't been protests in, in that sense. But uh, previous to the campaign, there have been many attempts to tell the story in the, in the, in the media. And there's been a lot of uh, attempts to, to just raise awareness in, in more personal ways. So I know that uh, Iranian students, um, Iranian Baha'i students in Western universities, and also non-Iranian Baha'i students, because the, the Baha'i community is not simply an Iranian community. Actually, most Baha'is aren't Iranian. It began in Iran, but it's a, it's a worldwide community. And people might try and raise awareness in a personal way through discussion groups or by screening the documentary to light a candle that that film was screened in about 300 locations around the world so that was one of the first ways that we started to try and get wider penetration of the story um, there are a lot of uh, attempts to tell this story whether it's through the film or through other personal actions um, but not uh, not not street action per se I think the, 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 the murals are the first street action that have taken place on behalf of this issue so finally I kind of want to wrap up with the uh, with the idea of um, of art because obviously what you're doing is uh, it's it's creative activism. Um, so I want to ask your opinion on on art as a as a catalyst for socio political change and uh, and even what you'd like to see happen from this in terms of your goals with the with this work. That's a great question. Uh, I think that. I think that art has a huge um, role to play in all positive change. Um, you know, we're, we're cutting together the documentary right now of our, of our street art campaign in New York and around the world. And one of the interviewees in the documentary refers to Bob Dylan's song, Hurricane. 
all about uh, the American African American boxer who was wrongly accused of of, of murdering somebody in uh, the 1950s, perhaps I don't remember the years. Um, and there was this big uh, there was this outcry um, against the fact that he was wrongfully convicted. And one of the part of that outcry was Bob Dylan's song "Hurricane," which is an amazing song, um, which uh, I think pretty much everybody will will be familiar with. And that song helped lead to a retrial uh, in due course and and for for change. So that's one very specific example. Um, street art itself, you know, muralism in Mexico, for example, had a big role to play in creating a Mexican identity after independence. Uh, across South America, it's always been used to uh, to advance um, certain agendas to do with, um, I think. Uh, popular empowerment um it's uh it's 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 a tradition that that has been used elsewhere as well and just generally speaking for me uh, as a journalist and, a, and as a writer i don't think any kind of social change is is uh is really happening unless it is reflected in the arts because people look to the arts for uh for a sense of understanding of what's going on in the world for a sense of their own selves and when the arts are reduced to mere entertainment entertainment is obviously important and, and art should be entertaining but when things are reduced to mere entertainment and they no longer speak to the needs of our society or the needs of our own hearts and souls, then that art is failing to really live up to its fullest potential, which is to, to, to push the conversation forward and to do that by, by touching people um, in, in, their, in the most personal way. I think that people can understand and such the argument for one policy or another or one kind of change to the system, system or another. But unless we do that by starting to empathize with other people, Unless we do that by starting to really think about the, the the ramifications of a particular structure in our society, then we're not really going to go. We're not going to take the step from from a, a relatively dispassionate um, and and unengaged uh, understanding to something that really uh, moves us to action and to, to maybe making a change in our own lives or our own immediate realities. And art is one of the things that has the power to to do that. So I, I think. No change is complete if it's not also um, being reflected in a change in the arts and change through the arts. So art is as essential as everything else. While this show often focuses on the direct action side of activism, last week and this week have focused on spaces outside of direct action that very often get glossed over. And some of you may be thinking, well, for fuck's sake, things are that dire. Well, yes, they are. But if we threw just everyone out into the streets, who would be organizing the messaging? Who would be the medic who hangs back to make sure that people are okay? Who would be the media making sure word and the truth spread? Who would be the artist creating resistance through paint, sculpture, dance, film, photography, words? Who would be creating those emotional pieces that open souls, that open minds? Who would be researching and analyzing our tactics, past tactics? Who would be dissecting plans, objectives, goals, and making sure that they make sense for we, the people? And if you're the person on the front lines, always the barricades, fuck yes, keep doing that. And if you're the person plotting routes for actions, scouting, researching, definitely keep doing that. If you're the person who coordinates artists across the world to raise their brushes for the sake of justice and education, also keep doing that. At the base of any resistance are a shit ton of roots, and we can't survive, nor can we grow, unless we use the power at every root. To learn more about Salim's project, visit notacrime.me.